Welcome to the Brazilian Businessmen podcast, episode number eight. Today, I'm joined by Mark, who's got a fascinating story who he's open to share, honestly, about the ups and downs of business, from having it all, living in the Bahamas, super successful, to then losing it all, and ended up in a bit of a sticky situation, to say the least. Um, that's as far as I'm going to say. Mark, you just want to introduce, and we'll, we'll kickstart your resilient journey. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me on, Chris. Um, yeah, I'm Mark Wyford. I'm currently based in the UK, 47 years old, um, although I feel a little bit older sometimes. But yeah, 47, I have two children. Well, not really children anymore, 18 and 22, two boys. And uh, yeah, I've uh, been an entrepreneur for a long time. Uh, probably my entrepreneurial journey started when I was uh, about 12 years old. Um, yeah so yeah 35 years really. <laughs> wow <laughs> it's quite common to hear that people have like paper rounds and selling sweets in schools and stuff and then it starts from there but where does your journey start if it started at 12 30 i guess it started uh so i was uh so i come from a very working class uh regular family but my uh my parents my dad specifically wanted to um try and put me through private school education and uh, that had its uh, advantages as well as its disadvantages I wasn't particularly academic my dad wasn't really insistent not insistent but keen for me to go based on that it was more the the discipline that I think certainly back then it gave you um i mean i left ended up leaving school with a gcse c or above in cooking so academically i was it was a waste of time i was more interested in in ways of making money mm. but being in this uh this school my last school in the chain of three that i went to um i had um which you may not even know about or remember but i had one of these the first kind of digital organizers called the scion organizer uh, spelt p-s-i-o-n and these were the bee's knees at the time and i was i've always been a bit of a tech uh geek and i had one of these and then i found a book that told you how to write programs um and all of my mates most of which had a lot more money than i did had got these scion organizers and i used to start oh, i started coding these um, little now looking back ridiculous programs can't even remember what they did but from this book and then I started selling this these programs to my mates for one and two quid and that's how it started and then that lasted for about six months until somebody realized hang on a minute there's a book and then it kind of uh, right. went but that was my very first thing and then about the age of, uh, I've always been into, I'm, I'm an animal lover. I've always loved animals. And as a kid, I had everything you can imagine apart from cats and dogs. Um, I had birds, all kinds of stuff. But uh, as a hobby, I, I was um, on my bike once seeing these birds fly around, fascinated why these birds were flying around in circle. Back then, Mess uh, went to the guy who I thought I could see where the, these birds were from, and it turned out that they were racing pigeons. And uh, I was fascinated that you could send these birds hundreds of miles away and they'd fly back. And I just thought how cool that was, and that got me into that. And I persuaded my mom and dad to buy me a, a second hand loft, and I started with a little loft. And then I needed another loft. And then uh, there was one in the local newspaper back then. And uh, that's how people advertise back then. And and we went to see this loft and the guy wanted uh, 300 pounds for this pigeon shed. Or he said, I want 350 pounds and you can take all the pigeons that are in it, which was 60 odd pigeons. And I pulled my mom aside trying to persuade her to let me get not just the loft but the pigeons i said i could i can i can sell some of them and that's how it kind of started i ended up getting a loft getting the pigeons and then i um sold all the pigeons paid for the loft and made a couple of hundred pound profit 
and that turned me on to that. And I, come the age of 17 years old, I was buying and selling racing pigeons. I was importing, exporting them all around the world. I sold the, the most expensive back then. I sold a pigeon for was 6,000 um, pounds to a guy in Japan. For one pigeon? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that was 1989, 90, something like that. But the world's most expensive pigeon back in 88 was 120,000 euros. Um, and how does a pigeon become that expensive or that valuable? Based on what it's, it's like racehorses, either if it's won races or if it's bred from very good stock based on its pedigree. Pigeons have pedigrees as well as like racehorses do. Yeah, so I started, uh, I mean, the world's most expensive racing pigeon now is 1.8 million. So really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, uh, so this, is a, this is a new world to me, so I don't know anything about it. Um, well, a lot of the trouble with the pigeons, I mean, I, as you can see, if you're watching the video, I've got a pigeon up there. That's our, our yeah. best one. He's uh, He won against, uh, he's called Hercules. He won against 15,000 pigeons. He was actually gifted to my son, but by the by, um, I yeah, I start, so I started with that, and that's kind of when I left school. I didn't want to do A levels, didn't want to do university. And um, back then, at come the age of seventeen, when I passed my driving test, you know, I was making fifteen hundred quid, two grand a month out of buying and selling uh, pigeons. But and that's thirty years ago. It was decent. That's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I did that. Um. And that was the first proper business that I had, really. Uh, at the height, I'd got like 450 pigeons that I was brokering for people or breeding from. It was, it was, it was pretty manic. And that's what really probably started me off um, on the entrepreneurial journey. Mm. Um, and I did that until I was probably about 20 years old. And then I... Um, now, actually, coming back a little bit, about the age of 18, I had um, I put an advert. I wanted to create a big pigeon race. And there used to be a magazine years ago back then called Business Age. And I placed an advert wanting uh, investors for this pigeon race. I mean, I'm smiling to myself now because... It's, you know the, the things you do um <laughs> but then i had i'll cut a really long story short that advert and caused me to get targeted by what at the time i thought was a genuine thing but really wasn't i was targeted even back then by a nigerian scammer really wow and this guy spoke to me every day on the phone it was a long, complicated story. Um, but being 18, this guy said, I've got a client. He's got millions of dollars to invest in real estate. I want you to help me broker the deal. That was the basis of it. And, and it, in between this, all of this, I'd got my passport ready and I was ready to fly to Nigeria. And it was the one time my mom and dad have stopped me in my tracks and said, that passport's going nowhere and you're going nowhere, which looking back was a great thing at the time. I wasn't very happy about it, but, um, but during the course of this climb that uh, I thought I was going to be representing, I got um, hold of a publication called the international real estate directory or something or other. And back then, so then I got all of these details of all of these um, property companies around the world and I sent a fax, a covering fax saying I've got this client interested in investing, please send me details of properties you've got and I was faxing all night these different companies very, not hardly anybody got back to me but one particular guy based in the Bahamas got back to me and his name was Harry and he called me the very next day and he said uh, this is Harry Dan here from calling from the Bahamas I got your fax and I told him the deal and he said, listen, I get one of these letters every week. I get one of these scammers every week. It's a scam. Ignore it. I'm like, no, these are the real deal. They're legit. 
And um, that's what took me in a whole other direction. That one ridiculously faxing a load of people trying to get details of properties for my multimillionaire real estate investor. Gosh. I got to speak to this guy called Harry. And Harry was based on Grand Bahama Island in the, in the Bahamas. And I spoke to him and he's like, ignore it. It's ridiculous. And I, me being me, I wouldn't at the time. But then after a, I was a persistent um, individual, to say the least. And I thought, I like the idea of the Bahamas. This guy was an English guy. He'd been over there for 30 years. And I thought, I like the idea of that. And in between time, I'd, at the age of 17, I'd gone to uh, the States on my own first ever trip abroad pigeon related stuff and i'd got this idea of setting up this pigeon race whatever so i went uh so i kept speaking to harry i kept calling him up and one day after probably three or four months of speaking to him he's like if you're that bloody interested in the bahamas get yourself over here and i'll put you up and i'll show you around wow so it sounds like you were very independent for such a young age and yeah i went to san diego at the age of 18 Las Vegas which was an experience when I've never been abroad before wow and I stayed as a guest of a pigeon guy over there and yeah it was a it was a hell of a time but then I so Harry said that and I think it was seven or eight weeks later I was there I said I booked my flight I've put the money together got my flight and coming over and I flew in and that kind of changed everything in a way because um I met Harry and he took the first night I was there, he took me down to the local marina. And I'd never really seen anything like this before. I, you know, like I say, relatively normal family, hardworking family from Leicestershire. Um, I'd always had it in my mind to go to the States. Um, and I'd seen San Diego and various places, but the Bahamas was a, 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 a different special place. And it was a, um it was a place that blew my mind so i went and to cut a long story short since that first time i used to go three four times a year and go over and spend time with harry who became my mentor really and so instead harry, of being on the beach sorry. so harry was legit this guy was legit obviously. Yeah, harry was a legit real estate broker over there um that had been over on the island for 25 years at the time and I, yeah, and so I went, that whole ridiculous Nigerian faxing people thing uh, led me to meet Harry Dan. And, uh, uh, and and I ended up going over three or four times a year. I used to stay with him and his family. And uh, it was, a, yeah, it was kind of a pivotal moment, really. And I, 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 I was... I was fascinated by the real estate business over there. I used to sit in his office and listen to him on the phone and in meetings. He used to introduce me as his internet guy. And from that, I had the idea of selling property. International real estate was my new thing because I knew about the internet all those years ago. So this is 97. Um, Sorry, what did the internet look like back then? Can you remember? Was it? <laughs> yeah, it was dial up modem. Yeah, sounds. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was right. like, wasn't it? Like, really, like, times just went. Yeah, it was in its infancy. Yeah. And uh, so I used to go to meetings and dinner with him. And so I had this idea of, uh, of trying to sell property online. I also had my other idea of doing this race still. I was dead serious about trying to do this pigeon race in the Bahamas. And I met with, he, Harry got me a meeting with one of the big hotels. The hotel said that they could have it in their grounds. Um, I, um, you may not know, do you know who Sir Freddie Laker was? No. So Sir Freddie Laker was the pioneer of low cost air travel, really. Right. He took British Airways on and won back in the day. And Laker Air was the very first company to introduce low-cost air travel. Wow. 
And so Freddie Laker used to live between Fort Lauderdale and Freeport on Grand Bahama Island. And Harry was a personal friend of his. So I'm banging on about this pigeon race. And I said, but I'm going to need somebody to take them down to the final race. So Harry's called up to Freddie. Said, I got a guy here I want you to meet. And literally an hour and a half later, I was on an Laker, a Laker, Laker Air flight from Freeport to Fort Lauderdale. And so Freddie's picked me up in his Rolls Royce and I've had a meeting with him. I mean, and he agreed to fly the the the, the pigeons down for the final race to another island, the Bahamas. It never went anywhere, but it was a hell of an experience. Um, and then I'm, tr- so I'm trying to sell property online, but way too early, way too early. And uh, and Harry said to me one day, you know, it's only one thing that's making any money. That's porn. Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to carry on with the, the, the property stuff. And then eventually after about six more months of <clears throat> getting nowhere fast with the property stuff, I looked into it. I started going along lines and I've spent hours upon hours researching it. I got ripped off left, right and center from a, a variety of people and companies. It was Wild West back then. but And by this time, I was living with my first proper girlfriend in a flat in Leicester, drive in a cab at night to pay the bills. And I uh, I was about 10 months into it and I was getting nowhere fast. And I said to my uh, girlfriend at the time, I said, look, give me three more months and if I haven't hit it, found something, I'll, I'll look for something else. Is this uh, producing, taking so- part? Like... What are you doing with the porn industry at this point? This was so. This was. <clears throat> this is that early that it was literally photos, legal and licensed oh, US okay. photos. You were buying. Um, I'd had a, I had a website called PornSearch.net, which I was trying to get up and running. Um, <clears throat> and then, so I, I, I set this three month deadline for myself and her mainly, uh, and in between, I about. A month before the deadline, I proposed. She said, yes, we've been together a couple of years. Excuse me one second. And uh, and I, I proposed. She said, yes. And then two weeks later, she left me. And I was, this was, I was a few weeks behind my deadline. Nice. Right. But the weirdest thing is the week she left, on the time I took her away, we went to Crete because I thought we needed some time together. I proposed in in Crete. In that time, I found this site called Adult Check, which was kind of like a, a, it was a different situation in at the time. You put sites up, but you were an essentially an affiliate and it had hundreds of sites and you paid one monthly membership and you got access to all the sites. And I got to speak to a guy that was doing it and he was owning good money. And I put four sites up while we were away on holiday just to see what happened. And I came back and I got my first paycheck literally a day or two later. So just within a week of her leaving, uh, no, it must have been a couple of weeks after. Um, within a week of her leaving, I got my first 300 and something dollar paycheck from this company i'm like so i've got the the heartache of her leaving and then i've got this well i've actually made money out of and i've spent 12 months of earning nothing Mm. so then i said to myself well if four earn that can 20 pay on my bill so i don't have to drive a cab at night and sure enough i coded them myself and they did and to cut a really long story short, I went from having those four sites making 300 and something dollars. And I went to 32,000 sites and I was in the space of a, 18 months, I was doing $2 million a year, 150 grand a month. Wow. What a transformation. Yeah. And uh, did you ever see that lady again or? No, I still friends with her on uh, Facebook. Actually, we through friends reunited, which again makes me feel really old. We, we we found each other. She's living in Australia now. She's all very happy, which is is great. 
And in the meantime, of that during that 18 months, I'd met uh, uh, a new girl and uh, and then she ended up being the, the mom of my uh, kids. So yeah, um, so then <clears throat> at this time, it was, I mean, it was, it was manic. It was, we were building 500 sites a day. And when I say sites, these were sort of three or four page sites, but I even got it automated to where it was building the sites. We'd plug in the content, plug in a load of site names and it just built them. It was, it was mad. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the start of that. And it was, uh, and I said to myself, <clears throat> regarding the, about the Bahamas, um, I want to live here. And uh, it took me five, six years to live there. But so this was uh, 98, 99, this was happening. And then in July um, 99, we were in the Bahamas, things were going great. And uh, I met Harry uh, with my new girlfriend at the time, Ben, and uh, he's like, <clears throat> "I'm tired of this real estate business. If you, if I give you some money, can you set me up with some sites and whatever?" And I said, "Of course, of course." And it doesn't do not give you any money, just yeah. And that was July '99, and then uh, a couple of weeks later, after we got back to the UK, um. I had a call with him and he got lung cancer. Wow. And uh and he died uh, Millennium Eve ninety nine. Gosh. Um, which hit me hard. And uh I'm glad that I went and managed to rearrange my diary to go back to his memorial uh service in January. But that that was hard. He was my mentor, he was a friend, he was the reason I was in this situation. Mm. His guidance um in that 18 months that was yeah and uh yeah so that was that was hard and uh and then we moved out to the bahamas in 2000 and uh 2001 uh semi-permanently and life was good you know life was great but <clears throat> The trouble I had is that I was essentially an affiliate. I owned the sites, but they owned the customer, this company. And it looked, it sounds ridiculous looking back now, but I couldn't, I, I'd reached my limit. I couldn't earn any more money. Two million was there. Well, it seemed to be my limit. I, I'd got 10% of their entire network. I couldn't make any more money. And some things started happening that were weird that didn't add up to me. And and so I said, you know what? <clears throat> Video is going to be big. I'm going to go and set my own network up. Well, you were certainly right there. Video was. <laughs> yeah. So I went and bought sexpass.com for $25,000. And I got I, by this time, I got 26 people part time and full time working with me. I was living a great life, Bahamas, during the uh, weekends. I was backward and forward to Florida. We set up a little office there. I said, I'm going to set my own network up. And uh, I found a buyer for my existing network, but he was paying me over time, paying me in installments. I said, it's going to cost $150,000 to set up. It didn't. It ended up closing cost. Ended up closing five hundred thousand dollars to set up, and um, I'd sold my existing network for a million dollars, but only two hundred grand down. And <clears throat> as we're developing and we're getting ready to um, to launch, weird things started happening. So much so I got the offices that we've got bug detected because I'm like, every move we make, this other company are making another move. Anyway, July um, 18th, well, qu really quickly in May 2021, I was driving down of the uh, freeway in Fort Lauderdale, going back to the Fort Lauderdale airport, and I'm, sit uh, I'm on the freeway and I'm playing some music. And I'm thinking, 
I can remember tapping the dash thinking, you've made it. Yeah, good feeling. You've done it. You've done it. You're going back to fly back to your wife and child in the Bahamas. You're in Florida. You've made it. That was May 2021. July 18th, 2021. Bang. Oh, right. 2021. Uh, sorry, not 2000. I was going to say. <laughs> 2001. 2001. I'm getting yeah. the decades wrong. 2001, May 2001. I thought I've made it. July 2001, 18th specifically. It was a Friday night. We'd launched a few days before. And then on the 18th of July, I'd got massive legal documents being fired at me via email and paper on three different continents. I'd hired a programmer that used to work with this other company. He was their key programmer in the early days. And they were trying to say that we stolen code and all kinds of stuff. And at the same time, they closed down the accounts of the guy that I'd sold my network to. So he's saying, I ain't paying you the other money I owe you, and I want my money back. Oh, God. And I definitely had a mole within my organization. I still to this day don't know who it was. Um, but basically, they closed him down, and it all started going wrong then. Now, I don't regret doing what I did and trying to set up my own network ready for video. But what I do regret is spending then the next 18 months fighting to keep this going, fighting with them, fighting always around and using all of the reserves I had to do so. In retrospect, I should have said, OK, I'm going to give it six months, keep these key staff to keep it going and keep the rest of the, the, the holdings I'd got and just say, right, give it six months and sit. Because with the money that was there and the, and, and the wealth I had there at the time, I could have easily gone. I mean, I always wanted to go into property. I looked around six houses in Leicester one day and I could have bought them all, <clears throat> but I didn't because every hundred grand that was put back into the business doubled in six months at the time. Wow. So it was a hard thing. Now, again, hindsight's a wonderful thing. But um, so I don't regret actually trying to do that because it get, in theory, it would have given my own independence. But what I do regret is carrying on to the bitter end to where I ended up nowhere near the position I should have been in. Is that um, the pride mark, do you think? Or why did you keep battling? Some pride, definitely some pride. Um, but also knowing video was going to happen. Mm. Um, knowing it was... We built a system ready for video. Um, so yeah, there was some pride there for sure, but technically we'd got a system that was, was great and ready for the future, but nobody was using it. And so there was, there's a mix of elements of it, but uh, yeah, so that, that's what, that started the downtrend essentially. And then, um, I kept fighting. I tried to partner with bigger companies. None of it worked for various reasons. And I came back uh, to the UK, 2002, and it's hard. It was hard. And and you look back and you think, um, you know, I, I think I, I can remember saying to myself, I'll give myself a couple of years and I'll turn it all around and it'll be fine. Um, but you do get a false sense of perspective. You get a false sense of, of what money is and the amounts of money and stuff. Um, just one second, I'm gonna lock my dog out of the office. Go on. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I came back to the UK and uh, tried still with when I was in the UK to get it going and the various meetings with different companies to do it. And it didn't work. It, 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 the industry knew about the problems I'd, I'd got then and it didn't work. And uh, I tried so many different things and and it was hard. And then 2004, what at the time I thought was the biggest um, thing, yeah, not disgrace is the wrong word, but the idea of having to go bankrupt. And I did. 
And uh, talk to me about that because I've seen a, a few people. Well, obviously, we're about to head into a recession as well, aren't we? So, any yeah, of, and, and, as, and at that, the end of the day, as long as you're not going bankrupt on individuals that matter, and that you know, personally, wasn't the banks. I didn't go in, I didn't. I, I didn't mind going bankrupt on banks, if I'm absolutely honest. I didn't go bankrupt on any individual, um, you know. So I went bankrupt, and um, and I was desperate because although I'd gone bankrupt, I owed friends and family money, and you can't turn around to your your, your friends and family and say, oh, "I've gone bankrupt. I'm not giving you the money." You can't do that. Mm. Uh, so in my head, I'd still got this debt. Well, I had got the debt. Uh, the bankruptcy only got rid of uh, the bank debts, really. And uh, and then, again, you know, stupid decisions get made when you're desperate. And I uh, I was that desperate that a web designer, a friend of mine knew, uh, knew at the time, said, oh, I know how to grow weed. And ridiculously, I started doing that. So was that in the space of a few years or just that was 2005 2006 and in again i look back and it was ridiculous to think now but i was really it was the first time in a few years i was really good at something right it sounds ridiculous but i was really good at this and uh i thought well if i'm going 20 can i go 200 and get these debts paid off be free grows my debts will be paid off and then I can just be free of all of this stuff and I can remember having a conversation with a friend of mine I said I don't know whether just to stick someone I know we're talking about the legal activity and people's own moral compasses but I would never do anything that I know it was it is illegal was illegal but I think there's a very big difference between weed and other such drugs i've never i would never ever no matter how desperate i was do anything other than weed because yeah i've got so similar, I'm all, come i've on. got similar uh, views as well to be fair mark so, yeah uh yeah i think it should be legalized but that's another story but so i made the decision that i was going to go and go 200 rather than just sticking to it small and figuring out what i was going to do and this was uh oh and then in july 2006 you know a few years it took its toll um and then in july 2006 one friday night my wife of, of my two boys just said she was leaving me wow and that took that hit me really hard and then uh five weeks later um well, a couple of weeks after that, I can remember sitting crying in my car with all the pressure of my wife leaving and this bloody weed grow we got going on in Leicester. And uh, and then in, two weeks later, I was at a lunch meeting with somebody and I got a phone call from the police. And uh, the one of the air conditioning units had caught fire in the building. God. Sprinklers <clears throat> came on. Water was coming out the front of the building, and fire brigade got called, and I got arrested the next day. <laughs> how much? I don't know if you open it to see if, if not, just cut it out. But um, how much were you making back then selling weed? It wasn't. I never sold any. That's the ridiculous thing. <clears throat> oh. This was the first grow. Oh God! <laughs> so the smaller grows I'd done. I just gave it to, to friends. <clears throat> Three weeks before the first grow was due to finish in this building, it caught fire. Oh, wow. So I got all the cost set up costs that I've had to borrow money to do. <laughs> and I never made a penny out of selling. Excuse me. So I got arrested. And two other people were working with on me got arrested. I was on bail for 14 months. But to be honest, <clears throat> I'm along the lines of what can I control, what can't I control. Me thinking at the time I can try and control getting my wife and kids back, 
that was my main priority, if I'm really honest, because I, I was going to do whatever I could with regards to this legal situation. My solicitor at the time said, listen, <clears throat> you got a, a chance of getting two to two and a half years. I was on bail for 14 months, which I've never been in trouble before in my life. Being on bail is horrible because you keep getting called back every three months. It's the unknown, I guess. It's yeah, just... your life's completely on hold. And yeah. my world was falling around around my ears, really, at the time. And, um, yeah, I was 14 months on bail. And then come October, um, well, just before the trial date, I started finding out about more about internet marketing and all of that stuff. And then the trial came... Well, it wasn't a trial because I pled guilty, but the hearing, my solicitor said, if you're, you're looking at getting two to two and a half years, 20% chance you'll get two to two and a half years. Uh, and I knew in my heart I was going to have problems. And I got to the 23rd of October, 2007, went to Leicester Crown Court, and the judge ended up giving me four years. What's going through your head at that point? My head was a shed. I was done. I've got two kids, two and six. Um, yeah. I was expecting two to two and a half and four. That's a long more time for me, never being in trouble. Mm. You're doing two years in prison with the system. Whereas if you get a two year prison sentence, that goes down to 12 months and then anything under four years anything under four years you can get tagging and what have you that gets you another four months out on tag so a two-year sentence becomes essentially an eight-month sentence whereas a four-year sentence you're doing two years and there's no tagging on all of this and it was horrible uh, it was uh <clears throat> it was i went to doncaster which was a uh, uh, an experience to say the least I was I was lucky to only spend a few weeks there and then I got moved to another semi-open prison um, and still affects me now thinking back I mean this is 2007 so it's a long time ago now really what is actual prison life like because it's all these documentaries what is it actually like it's, uh, i don't know why anybody would want to go back and I, I spent ended up spending 20 months in one prison called Sudbury, which was an open prison and i saw people coming back three four times to the same prison while i was doing the 20 months why the hell anybody would want to go back yes of course it's to do with people's quality of life and the social um, that they've got, you know, in their family situations and what have you. I saw people getting released from prison with nowhere to live. So I know it's a lot more complex issue, but I did 24 months. 24 days would have been enough for me to have never done anything again illegal. You know? Mm. Um, it, it took me three months for me to get my head around. At the same time, I've got I've got the, the the family situation, my kids, my ex-wife, but it took me three months to get my head around. And then I went into prison really overweight because in that 14 months, I just kept eating and drinking, which I'm not really a drinker, but... And uh, come back three months into it, I thought, right, well, you've got, you've got 21 months left. You better make the most of it. And I ended up, you know, I'm not into fitness, but I ended up starting to jog. I was 19 stone. I was a fat person. <laughs> and I ended up losing 50 stone, uh, 50 stone, 50 pounds. Being the best shape I've ever been in, going from never, never running anywhere to running uh, three miles a day and 10 miles on a Saturday um, around the grounds. And and I, you know, I, I got that side of my life sorted out. And then <clears throat> I was just as much as I could in the library. I saved up for a DVD player. I started getting some courses sent into me on DVD about marketing online and what have you. And I just, my, my cell ended up becoming a, <clears throat> a library, really. Right. I started learning about internet marketing and all of that stuff and just put myself into that. Visits in, in prison were really horrible. You, you, 
eventually I saw my kids uh, great. It's the one thing you look forward to every week, but it's the worst thing in the world when they leave. Yeah. And a really bad time, a uh, bad time. Um, but I came out <clears throat> October 2009, started again, and I got this in my head that internet marketing was the thing. Start doing that. The recession was kicking off around about then as well, though, wasn't it? I was too young yeah. to remember, but can you remember that? Yeah, that it, that it yeah, two thousand eight. Yeah, it was, it was hard, and you you paint <clears throat> you paint this picture of what life's going to be at, like when you're out. The fact that you're just out and you've got that freedom, you think life's going to be rosy and great. And when I went into prison with that, uh, with everything that was going on, I had started taking antidepressants. My doctor at the time before this as this thing was happening he said mark if any one of these <clears throat> things that have happened you'd have probably been all right but you've had three things happen you've had your relationship break down unexpectedly you've got this legal problem and the business you've got falling around around your ears that is a lot yeah and uh and i and i i was always anti-depressant i was always anti-antidepressants but I went on to antidepressants. I've got IBS. I've got migraines every day. I went into prison in not a great way at all. Um, but uh, I, in my head, I've got this thing of, right, I want to get off all the medication I'm on before I get out, which I achieved. Can you remember what it was? Medication. What, like, what was the name of the medication? Uh, at the time, I was on fluoxetine. For, uh, for the depression I was on uh, Pazotaven for the um, uh, the anti-migraine stuff I was I can't remember what the IBS tablets were but I was like an OAP going to the prison pharmacy it was I'd got that much stuff or it felt like I had so I decided I was going to come off everything before I got out and I did excuse me but the fluoxetine the, uh, the antidepressants that lasted three months because life's not as easy as you think just because you're out. Mm. And, and it was hard. Yeah, I had to move back in with my parents, which was great that I could. Again, I'd learned that people are getting released to nowhere. So I got, I'm got i blessed to have a family around me that supported me through thick and thin, no matter what. And I'd start rebuilding again. And uh, yeah, and, and I got the idea of... So I came out of prison with my 40-odd pound I was deeper in debt coming out than I was when I went in. Really? Because of stuff that had happened in the two years that happened. And it was it was not great. It was, you know, it was a, a it was a horrible time. And I started it. again. You go into prison, you think, oh, I'm gonna come out, but then the debt doesn't just go away, does it? It's still there. And then... No, the debt accumulates. And uh so I said to a friend of mine that used to be in the in the porn game. A friend of mine called Brad Goss, who's now a full-time comedian. He's had a completely 180 shift from uh, three, you know, from from what he used to do. And I said, "Look, I got to start making some money." And he's like, "There was a thing called the Warrior Forum. It's still going now. You can put a um, digital products up, and people buy them." And he said, "Well, what have you got? You've got a mobile phone, and you've got a Mac laptop, which I managed to to keep hold of." So what can you do? Well, you can make some tracks using GarageBand and you can sell them as royalty-free music. And that's why I did. I spent a week and a half doing that um, from my bedroom at my parents' place at the age of 34. Pretty depressed, if I'm honest. But I did that and it ended up making like $4,500, that product. Nice. And that's what started me off. And then... I started going to various seminars and I thought, right, that's what I want to do. And it took me about 18 months to speak on stage about marketing online. I'd learned a lot and finally got onto a big stage talking about it. I thought, I don't really want to be selling off stage. That's not my thing. I don't want to be selling to people that have got their last 500 quid on their credit card. It didn't feel right. Uh, and I went down that whole route and I, and yeah, and you know what, it did all right. And then um, 2011, Again, my friend Brad told me about Bitcoin. And he'd spoken to six or so other people before it. Nobody else got it, wasn't interested. And I'm like, I like 2011. that. 2011. Wow, gosh. Yeah. Tony came in the mainstream, really, yeah, but from yeah. 
my feel about the last couple of years since yeah, the yeah. Yeah. exactly the 2011 i got hooked into that i started mining it um really? obsessed with it wow and uh and yeah for the last 10 years i've been involved in crypto and uh i tried to launch my own uh, coin in 2015 but again i was too early this is the really short version of it i was trying to do too many things and i was two years too early if i'd have launched it in 2017 things would have been very different you couldn't fail to to get a successful launch in 2017 but i was just too early and that's mm. something i've learned timing is everything mm. um and that bankrupted me for a second time 2015 uh banks token launch it was um but again as long as you keep learning you've got to keep going on 2017 fast forward despite everything probably the worst time of my life I ended up being suicidal without knowing it found myself down a country road with gaffer tape and hose pipe and not even knowing how I got there wow um and that was a big turnaround for me um time to clear the decks and really take stock of where I'm at I ended up moving into a caravan in a friend's field spent 18 months there and weirdly one of the best times of my life. I'd got no overheads to worry about. I'd got a little bit of electricity to pay for this caravan. I bought, I sold off a load of stuff, bought this caravan, spent 18 months in there, uh, waking up to in front of open fields every day. And actually that was a big turning point, positive turning point. It took away a lot of the stress and the pressure. Um, and I started by then I'd started brokering crypto Bitcoin. And uh, the end of 2017 was the first big boom for, for crypto. And I was doing really well uh, brokering from this caravan in a field. Oh. <laughs> and uh, it was it was good. And I'll continue to broker. That was kind of what was my main thing. But then the FCA got involved two years ago and you need a license to do it. And the reality is that the 700 odd companies that apply for a license, is a, there's less than 10 that have actually got one. So the FCA don't want anybody being able to deal with it. They only want big companies. It was a blow. But I've, um, yeah, and that's the short version because I realized for time we're, we're uh, we're struggling on that, but what I would say with regards to, um, well, two things with regards to mental health <clears throat> and resilience, I've been in the darkest times of my life. This is the short version of of all of that, and I have got to a point where I never thought I would get to. I, you know, I got two kids, I've got a great family around me. I hadn't got a partner at the time, but apart from that, I've got a good group of people. One, a couple of things I would say about it. Unless you've experienced it, you don't get it. It's hard to get it. You can't get it unless you've had it. And if you are going through it, as I try and say as many times as I can on social media, if, if, if you're listening or watching to this now and you're going through hell with mental health, me telling you things will always get better will not make a blind bit of difference to you hearing this now. But trust me, after the story I've told you, and that is the short version, it will. I have had times thinking I'd just be better off having a heart attack. The life insurance would pay off out and everybody would be OK. And I haven't got the guilt of, of taking my own life because it wouldn't have been my thing and that would be the easiest way. You find yourself in way in thinking things you would never, ever believe. But if you're listening to it now and you are going through hell, it may not be very impactful to hear it, but trust me, things do get better and they can change. And that's all you can say. But again, you can look at back retrospectively and say, yes, he's right. But if you're going through that now, nothing that anybody says really matters. Yeah, I'll I'll I've struggled myself on multiple occasions and when you're in the thick of it 
just nothing seems to go right. But we're both still here, <laughs> alive. And, and, and that's the, and that's the key thing. And and with regards to resilience in business, a couple of take homes I would say. If you say something's going to cost a grand or ten grand or a hundred grand to do, double it because it always ends up pretty much doubling. If you say something's going to take three months to do, assume it's going to take six. Yeah. Because six. timing, I have been way too early. I was I was banging on, I was standing on stage telling people Bitcoin was money $50,000 one day when it was only $1,000 and people were not believing me. Gosh, I wish I knew you then. I'm, I'm a massive <laughs> believer in crypto. It's going to change the world as we know it. DeFi and all of the smart contracts and blockchain technologies out there is going to change the world as we know it. It's the one thing I'm most passionate about. Um, but timing is everything. Mm. If I'd have launched that token, that coin in 2017 instead of 15, I'd have been a multi, multi-millionaire again. Well, wouldn't be sitting here now. <laughs> Put it that well, way. Hopefully, maybe would do, but just slightly moved ahead in the plans. Yeah. So I would say, with regards to mental health, that like I said, but with regards to planning, look, I I'm not entirely convinced whether entrepreneurs are born or molded. I my my dad's always worked for himself but again that's that you you're self-employed big difference between being self-employed and an entrepreneur i think the early days of seeing one of the big benefits of, of the schooling i had was i saw how the other half lived as it were and i go you know i can remember being seeing all my mates being picked up in mercs and bmws and what have you and then my dad coming and picking me up in a datsun 120y which is the old nissan name for nissan at the time, it's embarrassing as hell. But mm. actually, looking back, it gives you both sides of life. So I think my entrepreneurial side came from that, maybe. And then meeting people like Harry and seeing people that, you know, I remember sitting down to a lunch a dinner meeting when he made a $100,000 commission over one dinner meeting. And I'm like, that blows my mind. That's like a belief shift just like that, isn't yeah, it? Like, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So... If you are an entrepreneur, be prepared that you it's going to cost you one way or another. I mean, reality is it's cost me relationships. I'm blessed to have uh, a girl I've been with for five years now, Gabby. She's the most tolerant woman I've ever been with. But it is going to cost you one way or another, whether that be relationships time with friends and family i my laptop i'm talking to you on goes pretty much everywhere with me um and it is going to cost you but that's why the, the, the one of the best books i've ever read uh was a little bit tongue-in-cheek book but it, it's still a book that i recommend everybody reads because i think it's a major power shift in the mind that's by a guy uh, who's sadly no longer with us called Felix Dennis. He used to be the owner of Dennis Publishing. Uh, it's called How to Get Rich. But as I say, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. But it tells you about his story with the Viz magazines. He was a publisher. Uh, he, when he died, he was worth over 600 million. Wow. Worth a read. Because it, it, it sets out, no holes barred, what it takes. Now, all these years on, my life has changed a little bit. The trouble I had back in the day when I was doing the big things, I'd got zero. I'd like, I was looking at the guy that was paying me my checks every month. And I thought, right, I'm making 2 million a year. He's making a million a week. Surely I can make a million a month is my next thing. Mm. But I'd got nothing between, uh, and, and I've got really no, there was no filter. There was there was no major plan in my head. You can get two. You can get big eyes, as a friend of mine used to call it. Why wasn't I happy just earning two million a year and then go and do something else, mm. and not feel controlled by that? Um, yeah. So you know, I, I've learned a hell of a lot, and as long as you learn, um, 
I, I still am a believer that everything happens for a reason. Certainly my relationship with my wife happened for a reason. Um, I'm still not got quite the reason. I'm not fully identified the reason why I made those bad decisions all those years ago. But they're coming out. And from a point of view of moving forward and where I'm at now, um, I have two major focuses in my business. I have uh, my crypto focuses still, and I have realentrepreneur.com. And they're my two main things. Ironically, one of the projects I'm working on um, within the crypto space may actually get me back to the Bahamas because <laughs> the Bahamas, this would be a whole weird full circle thing. Wow, it will happen. It's going to happen. I can just tell. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, with everything I've been through with crypto, people have said, why don't you just give, give up on it? And, I, and, I ha and I've been close to it before because I had some bad luck with stuff. I mean, the, the hundreds and hundreds of Bitcoin that I've, I've that have come through my wallet in the years, it, it, it can get depressing when you think about it. Mm. Been ripped off for 10, 20, 50 Bitcoin, ridiculous numbers. Um, looking back now. Mm. But I know crypto will get me back to somewhere where I want to be, which is not the 100 plus million at the time I wanted. It's a lot less than that, but it will get me back. It's just a matter of time and being a bit more patient. So, yeah, I'm, I'm heavily passionate about the crypto. That's the main thing that's dominated the last 10 years. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on could get me back to the Bahamas. The Bahamas are changing their legislation for crypto companies. Um, an idea I had in 2019 could actually happen now. It's the right time. Again, timing. So in a weird twist, I may actually end up being back in the Bahamas based out of there with the crypto business. And my real entrepreneur, and the real entrepreneur is a way like you're doing with what you're doing. It's a way of trying to help people and be real there's a lot of you know a lot of fake people there's a lot of bad advice out there if you said 20 years ago i want to be an entrepreneur people would laugh at you mm. now everybody wants to be an entrepreneur everyone yeah uh but there's a lot of fake and there's a lot of just not real out mm. there and i was lucky enough to get the name real entrepreneur and that's that's and they're my two main things. I've got other bits and bobs going on. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're the two main focuses and that's it. Um, and with, with Real Entrepreneur, it's everything I've learned in the last 30 odd years helping other people. I, I, I'm i excited by, although we are going into uh, bleak economic times, um, th that will create opportunities. And I think anybody looking to start their own business or make that shift, people need real world advice. Mm, and you've from got people who have been there and done it. And as I say, apart from serious, ill, physical health, I, there's not a lot. I've been lucky. I've been blessed to have no physical ill health, but there's not a lot else I've not been through. And I think I know because I do help uh, people with it. And that's, and that they're my two things. And yeah. You know, and I'm looking forward. I'm, I'm listen. I'm I'm 50 years old in three years' time, which makes me a dinosaur in the crypto industry, and uh, feel old anyway. Um, but it's always having that belief that I will get back to where I want to be in in everything, and, and and things are a hell of a lot better than they were. And, and when I look back to having to borrow 20 quid to get petrol to get home when I come out of prison. Uh, I quite often look back to those days and being in there and thinking you're doing a lot better and it's taking stock of where you're at. Now, am I happy? No. Uh, am I happy with where I'm at? Am I content? Far from it. Mm. But with what I've got going on, 12 to 24 month overview of plan, I can see to keep going, keep executing the plans we've got and things will be a lot better. Mm. that they have been for the last however many years. Just a quick one on Bitcoin. Where do you think that can be, like the value of Bitcoin in the next 10 years? Because a lot of people say, oh, X amount. But where do you think? And well, where... again, this podcast is going to be around for years. So the price now, right now, whether I think, I personally think it's going to take a hit. 
in the short term. Uh, listen, my personal, again, it's not advice, it's not investment advice. My personal opinion is I, I was sitting on stage in Manchester 2015 saying Bitcoin would be a $50,000 thing, and it was. Bitcoin will be over $100,000 at some point. Mm. It's just a matter of time. If you start running the numbers, it could be significantly more than that. My advice, it's not advice. My thoughts are people should hold a bit as a long-term uh, strategy. Yeah, it's worth holding. Mm. Um, we've, yeah, we've got a lot going on in space. And, and crypto is going to change the way the world works. And Bitcoin specifically, look, all markets have their ups and downs. The difference now is that when the stock market was going down previously, Bitcoin would go up and it, there's more correlation to the stock market now, which actually means it's becoming more mainstream. Mm. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, as we speak, it's 22,000 shy dollars, $22,000. I do think it's going to come down more personally in the short term, but that's only my personal opinion. But yeah, long term. I mean, I know somebody that's holding a decent amount of Bitcoin. He's not selling a single one until it reaches $125,000. Yeah. But I, I do believe long term it will be a, 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 an Ethereum as well. Yeah. Well, there's there's a few, but that's probably another conversation for something uh, else. Just invest in its long term game, isn't it? Rather than short -term. Yeah, yeah, nobody going into it for short term. It's a five year plus. People, friends and, and 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 colleagues around that I still that still call me, you know, it's a five plus year thing. Yeah. It should be anyway. Well, Mark, well, this has been one of the most resilient journeys I've ever heard. <laughs> it's like you could make a film out of it from the pigeons, San Diego, Bahamas, losing it all. Wow. That Matt Damon will play me. <laughs> you just took me on a right old journey there. <laughs> Wow. Any um, last words on, on that resilient journey? Or no, Just keep going. Anybody keep listening, going. watching to this, keep going. If you want it enough, you'll get it. No matter how hard it gets. Sometimes I sit there thinking, right, you know, is it the time to catch break or whatever it may be? But I do, I am a firm believer in everything happens for a reason. As long as you're learning along the way, keep going, never give up and don't back down and don't listen to naysayers either listen to advice from people that know what they're talking about but don't listen to naysayers because it's too many people want to bring your ideas down and if i'd have listened to my first proper girlfriend i would never have found the thing that worked to get me the first paycheck to take me on that journey mm. people don't understand your vision do they so you just gotta listen to people who's ahead of you and then Follow your gut and believe in yourself. Yeah. You have indeed. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time, Mark. Um, no worries, mate. Thank this you. Has been Resilient Businessmen podcast, episode number eight. Um, see you in the next one.